Olof, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Has the speaker joined? Has our speaker joined? Same, same. Yes, sir. He's with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then, shall I begin the proceedings? Shall I begin the proceedings? Yes, sir. You should start. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to request Dr. Sujato Ghosh. Thank you, Anup. Uh, this is uh, our second day of uh, uh, just a minute, just uh, just a minute. Uh, Shubhodi, uh, Dr. Paul, can you can you hear me and can you see me? Dr. Paul, yes, can I be heard? Uh, Shujat. Yes, Shujat. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Paul. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, all our participants out there. Our very eminent speaker, Dr. and his classes, and uh, so so uh, Shubhodeep needs very little introduction. But I'll give a formal formal. I'll welcome as a convener of this the six day online uh, lecture series uh, on English literature 2021, organized by the Department of Institute. Uh, announced that our principal, Dr. Manubendra Mandol, is the chief patron of this of this online lecture lecture series, and without his inspiration, without his encouragement. We simply would not have managed to do this. Uh, 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 while welcoming, uh, I uh, welcome Dr. Dr. Paul to share his knowledge and his experience with the student community, uh, the teachers, students, scholars, enthusiasts who have joined here in Google Meet and since it is being streamed live on YouTube. A lot of people uh, are simply uh, uh, waiting for this day to hear Shubhodi, and this is hugely an anticipated as we all can feel. To give a very formal introduction of uh, Dr. Dr. Pan, uh, I had already mentioned that he is currently the student professor, Department of English, School of Literature and Language, Cultural Studies, Baku University. Formerly, he was the uh, assistant professor of the postgraduate department of English, Maulana Azad College, Kolkata. He had been a guest faculty in uh, Lady Bourbon College, Kolkata. Uh, he was a UGC senior research fellow at Jadipur University. Uh, he did his own film, uh, critiquing uh, and on re evaluation of uh, South Asian diasporic sensibility in Indian expatriate literature. He did his PhD on uh, the East-West uh, cultural polarizations in Indian English fiction. And among the books quoted by Dr. Paul, they are anxieties, influences, after and after, uh, colon, a collection of critical essays on post-colonialism and new colonialism that came out from Worldview Publishers uh, in association with Wimbledon Press UK 2009. I still remember his first book of book of poems uh, because I had been an admirer of Shubhadeep's poems, and I still remember his first book of poems, uh, Finite Sketches in Finite Pictures, that came out in 2009. Uh, among his fictional and non fictional writings uh, that are featured uh, in a number of journals and uh, newspapers, uh, 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 they are featured in Arrow Road Journal, in Blue Mineral Literary Journal, the Urban Clan Journal, uh, the Sunday Statesman, the Telegraph, Hindustan Times, and definitely Low Press, Edinburgh. Uh, these are the formal introductions of Dr. Dr. Paul, but uh, uh, to me, Dr. Paul, above all these things, uh, is something which uh, uh, somebody had told me once that, well, uh, we, we bring out scholars, we bring out great teachers, but uh, uh, in our century, in our times, we really bring out thinkers. I would like to introduce Dr. Shubhadi Paul, above all these things, a very, very deep thinker. I feel privileged to invite Dr. Paul uh, in our lecture series. And on behalf of the organizing committee, I welcome Dr. Paul and uh, invite him uh, to give his speech. And uh, uh, over to you, Dr. Paul. Thank you very much for being here. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shujatu. Uh, at, at the very outset, uh, let me thank the entire college. Uh, let me thank the chief patron, Dr. Manovendra Mondul, principal of Belda College. Uh, let me thank the organizing secretary, Dr. Uh, Oshit Panda, 
Uh, let me thank all the conveners and co-conveners, uh, Madam Kuheli Shingho, uh, Mrinal Kanti Dash, uh, Orup Kumar Rokhit. Uh, I think the members, uh, Shoma Maharana, Rituparna Mahapatro, all the professors. Um, and uh, last but definitely not the least, uh, my friend and colleague for, I think, around a decade and a half, uh, Dr. Shujato Ghosh. Uh, it is an immense pleasure to be speaking to uh, the immediate audience and, of course, the broader, you know, uh, virtual audience at large. Now, um, having said that, uh, I, I would uh, like to mention at the very outset that uh, Though I would be speaking about, uh, you know, in specific, the idea of spatio-temporalities uh, in the political sonnet uh, with reference to Ozymandias, um, I wouldn't be just restricting myself to uh, the critical uh, specification of my lecture uh, as per its title. Uh, I would like to kind of, you know, uh, deal with my lecture in an overarching, uh, rambling manner, keeping in mind the fact that there is uh, a significant undergraduate audience. It's part of the CBCS and all that. Um, and and uh, of course, if there are uh, observations uh, and questions and uh, even criticisms, I'll be welcome to uh, take that at the end. Uh, so uh, P.B. Shelley, as you all know, is uh, indeed a controversial figure, uh, a controversial personality, uh, not just as an artist, but as a person as well. Uh, and his views on uh, religion, uh, atheism, socialism, free love uh, are very radical and libertinish. Uh, and, and likewise, I, I think they are also very uh, controversial. But then the word controversy itself is uh, controversial, according to me. Uh, so uh, I think this radicality was uh, by and large misunderstood in his own time. But uh, in retrospect, we have come to appreciate the man and his works in a better light. Now, uh, Ozymandias, uh, I think, is uh, definitely one of the most uh, celebrated poems uh, not just by Shelley, but of the entire Romantic era. Uh, it was published in January 11th, uh, 1818, in the weekly paper, The Examiner, and it was uh, subsequently republished in the 1819 collection, uh, Rosalind and Helen. Now, these are uh, some of the statistical you know, uh, information which I might be giving to you time to time in course of my lecture. Uh, but... Uh, if I look at the basic impulse behind the poem, uh, the central uh, lies to do with, uh, or has to do with the idea of melomania, which is, of course, world conquest. And of course, uh, as we all know, the inscription uh, at the on the pedestal of the statue, the broken statue that we are talking about, does mention uh, Ozymandias as the king of kings, which I think is an epithet that most um, across the spectrum of history uh, have been very, you know, uh, kind of fond of, I should say. And uh, the overblown and high-headed uh, Ozymandias also, you know, kind of uh, makes it a, a sort of a declaration. Uh, Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. So there is uh, this idea of an uh, egotistic superiority complex, which is uh, definitely mentioned. And uh, most of the emotions which are put forth uh, in course of the, you know, sculpture uh, and, and in course of the presentation of the sculpture and the reception of the sculpture are also to do with uh, hyperbolic, you know, uh, emotional outbursts. Uh, and there is uh, this uh, uh, feeling that uh, there will be an awe and terror uh, that will be instilled in the throbbing, simple lives of the uh, people who will be uh, looking up to this, you know, wonderful and very powerful, significantly powerful uh, emperor. And uh, I think this is the same desire uh, that had the 
uh, gifts him a, a sort of this world map in the form of a globe. And it's one of the first times that, you know, the international uh, spread of the landmass is made available to uh, this part of the world. And then Jahangir, out of curiosity, wants to know, uh, you know, where uh, is his kingdom and how far is he uh, the ruler um, of, of which provinces? And when he comes to realize that he rules over a very small portion uh, of what is actually the world, uh, then he is not pleased with the gift. Uh, and he mentions that this is a gift which should be shunned and should not be brought to public notice. Uh, and, and we find that, you know, like in these kind of uh, names where Prince Salim is not going to be a proper name, it has to be Jahangir or it has to be Shah Jahan. It has to be, it has to be somebody who is the lamp of everything or the glory of everything. Uh, and, and of course, the idea of being a world Caesar is, is very important. Uh, so, so based on that, we also know about the story of uh, Alexander who could not cut the Gorgian knot. Uh, and we also know about the historical uh, predicament of uh, the then Great Britain, which had uh, in course of time shrunk to the idea of uh, Little England. Um, and, and even uh, down literary history we had seen, and even in the course of world history we had seen uh, that even uh, the, 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 the supremacy of uh, the, the, the Queen of England got challenged and, uh, you know, there was the parliamentary uh, demand that she should also be paying taxes like uh, the common uh, individual or the common Britisher. So uh, these are some of the, you know, uh, anecdotal evidences that, that clearly tell us uh, that the fate of Ozai Mandius is not specifically the fate of uh, Ozai Mandius only. It is, it is a universal predicament. It is uh, a, a universal, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, idea which kind of, you know, works on everyone, just as birth and death uh, perhaps works for everyone. Uh, but what is more interesting is the fact that there are uh, micro stories behind the main uh, storial structure of this poem. Um, and, and before I come to that, um, I would just want to tell you uh, in passing mention that I feel from my reading of the entire, you know, uh, let's call it the, the entire canon of uh, romantic poetry, um, the first generation, the second generation romantic poets and all that, that Ozymandias is perhaps one of the most uh, perfectly crafted, the most perfectly worded the most perfectly structured, uh, one of the most perfect poems in, in, in uh, romantic literary history. You know, it, it's brief, but it is so uh, significantly uh, compact and uh, the words are so wonderfully chosen. Uh, it's a sonnet in iambic pentameter, uh, but it defies a conventional uh, Pet uh, Petrarchian pattern. Uh, the octave, uh, the, the, the eight liners and the sestet, the six liners are interlinked. The old rhymes are replaced by new ones. So, so there is a, a lot of experimentation also. But what is most interesting is this, that all of this is toppled with that single dominant metaphor, which is the ironical disapproval, which is meted out to the idea of monomania. Because ultimately, you know, when we are talking about uh, megalomania, there is uh, a very vital element of narcissism uh, more than the idea of, uh, or, or more than the requirement of a, a sort of a compulsion to, you know, uh, bring everything under control. Uh, and of course, there is a section of historians who always uh, ask thou art, uh, dust to dust thou returneth. That is exactly uh, what is workable here. The power of history is impersonal. The power of history is indiscriminate. Uh, political power, no matter how powerful, is ultimately ephemeral. And uh, of course, if I go by uh, Shirley's poem, death is indeed uh, a leveler. There is no challenging that. Uh, and the ultimate residue is, uh, is, of course, the derelict statue, which is covered in sand and uh, which is the ultimate outcome of the basic uh, hubris of humanity.
so of course there is uh, th there are a lot of things which are you know <clears throat> contained in this uh, let's call it this symbolic package of this uh, broken statue or dilapidated you know bust uh, which which of course uh, goes up right in the torso um and uh, going further let me also tell you that uh, the political sonnet you know is is an interesting uh, subgenreic specimen uh, because uh, most of us are conditioned with this idea uh, that the sonnet is usually for uh, the you know uh, the, the penning of the uh, ideas which are normally associated with the theme of love but uh, the sonnet has uh, also been uh, employed uh, for uh, you know talking about political power talking about political injustices socio cultural injustices um, and uh, you know that way i think uh, that throws a new light into how the political and the personal uh, eventually fuse together come together and and create uh, or generate a new sense of meaning uh well uh, shelley definitely had more uh, topically relevant uh, political sonnets like uh, england in 1819 uh, where uh, you know uh, there is a more specific connotation of uh, the historical dimension that i'm talking about ozymandias is definitely much more universal but what it does definitely harp upon is the idea that decadence is inevitable nothing is at the heart of everything uh, or as we have heard in uh, king lear nothing will come out of nothing uh, it is worth contending whether you know the seeds of existentialism absurdism nihilism um, are to be found in this poem as well because you see uh, despite the romantic hopefulness uh, romanticism was basically uh, about a certain unflowering of hope uh, of possibilities uh, you know dystopic outcomes and dystopic uh, you know wordings were actually not the, the the foundational purpose of romanticism but in this poem there is that line you know uh, nothing beside remains you know this is this is all uh, that is there and even when we want to cleanse of everything you know even when we seek a uh, total purgation of anything any kind of you know thing that you kind of uh, tend to think about you want to do away with this completely and you want to reinstall a new structure uh, what you will definitely find uh, or discover is the fact that nothing is completely uh, subject to a cent percent erasure you know there are these uh, traces that remain there is always that uh, residue that remains you know or, or as we uh, know in psychoanalysis that uh, you can subject everything to fire and you can burn it uh, in 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 any number of permutations and combinations but ultimately when it is reduced to the residue which is ash you can't burn ash further you know it's it's the ultimate product so of course uh, the remnant of the statue is a sort of a symbol and and of course romantic poetry is definitely uh, about symbolism we all know that but then what kind of a symbol is it that we are talking about i'll come to that later uh, what is important is this that the legacies of the ottoman empire the egyptian empire in this context uh, the roman empire the german empire all these empires they tell us the basic same story which is this that desertification or decrepitude uh, is not really preventable in in the long run uh, and of course even though britain uh, had a very uh, pompous uh, you know anthem we all know about that rule britannia rule the waves uh, britain shall never be slaves uh, ultimately Uh, leave alone the waves, or maybe uh, it's only the waves that they could uh, rule over because the lands were lost uh, at the end of the day. When after uh, the Second World War, uh, due to the rise of uh, the nation states, new nation states, uh, much of that you know uh, gigantic uh, British Empire where the sun never set uh, eventually collapsed. Uh, 
so what uh, extends uh, at the end of the day is is not gigantic uh, or mammoth empires uh, where you know the horizons cannot be seen ultimately what remains perhaps uh, are the lone and level sands that stretch far away i'm quoting from the poem the lone and level sands that stretch stretch far away so uh, the 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 symbol of the desert is is definitely very important because uh, number one it is not arable it is not fertile definitely uh, and number two uh, there is this idea that it was once fertile but now it has uh, you know been subject to some kind of you know decadence uh, which was not as i mentioned preventable uh, and uh, the desert uh, you know like if if you have Uh, studied novels like uh, uh, Voss and others, uh, you know, you would understand uh, desert fiction and all that. You would understand that the desert is um, a, a sort of a natural formation which you know perpetually keeps changing its shape, like the weather. You know, so so uh, the sands uh, are are very important because not not only that they are literal, but uh, metaphorically speaking, we are also talking about the sands of time. you know uh, which uh, keep passing through the hour glass and no matter how much we try we cannot uh, stop time so uh, time is all that we have to use or utilize and time is all that we lose at the end of the day rest uh, i think everything is a lease which is given to you your wealth your glamour your beauty your family everything is actually a lease which is given to you for a a, a certain period of time but ultimately it it is that sense of utilization of that time uh, which becomes such a, a very vital proposition uh, and the two specific you know words in this connection are please uh, you know look at this loan loan sum so we are all alone in death and the other is level which again you know talks about the idea of Uh, leveling or death the leveler or ultimately everything is is going to be you know cut straight and uniform uh, this uniformity is definitely absent when we are talking about uh, aristocracy when we are talking about monarchy when we are talking about plutocracy uh, definitely anything which has not to do with uh, democracy and republicanism um uh, would not be in the interest of general welfare but i think ultimately uh that is a, a theme which is uh, bound to be you know discussed and and shelley does that wonderfully well now let me talk a little bit about uh the title uh, of my you know uh, paper uh you see like uh, although the the very idea of spatio temporality or in my case in the plural Uh, temporalities might be uh, might sound to be a little kind of you know uh, difficult for uh, an undergraduate audience i'm not sure about that but still if we have a teleological you know uh, idea of historiography which is let's call it the history of history then we would understand one thing which is this that uh, the space time coordinates you know when they criss cross each other when there is there is this basic uh, inter uh, sectional understanding of of space and time the ordering of space and time then time is not always to be understood in the sense of a linearity of uh, progress you know uh, although in 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 the sense of you know the basic idea of history we always consider uh, things in, in in a linear pattern because of the uh, you know positioning of past present and future uh, in, in terms of a linear trajectory of understanding but then we have seen in the case of you know uh, the poetry of w b yeats and others that uh, history can be uh, you know a, a spire it can be a gyre it it can work itself out in in a number of ways history repeats itself and so on and so forth uh, i'm not going into all that but what is important is this that when i am talking about temporality in the singular sense then i understand that you know i am uh, talking about our you know mortality the human frame itself uh, which uh, can definitely not be prevented from aging and dying 
you know, it is ultimately uh, subject to uh, decay and then the eventual uh, demise. So uh, since we all lead time bound lives, we are not immortal in that sense. So we are uh, subject to, uh, you know, the idea of temporality. And whichever uh, spatial dimension we inhabit, I'm not going into space theory and all that, but uh, whichever spatial dimension we inhabit, this is a universal operative that we must remember. But what is interesting is if I use that word in the plural sense as well, in the sense of temporalities, then we can use that word in the sense of, you know, multiple material possessions and acquisitions. Uh, for instance, the, you know, the temporalities of the ruler or the clergy, you know, uh, all the possessions that we ultimately have, uh, the, the properties, the possessions, the material uh, heirlooms, the, the gifts and the legacies that we, uh, or our earnings and all that, everything is ultimately not going to stay with us. Uh, so these acquisitions that actually segregate people, you see, a ruler is different from a common man because a ruler has uh, a, a modicum, you know, uh, uh, sense of possession which the common man doesn't have. That is what, you know, distinguishes the elite or the rich from the poor and the disenfranchised. So uh, despite that, you know, in the sense of the total corporality at work, you know, if you go by uh, the sense of uh, extended corporalities, we would understand that it basically tantamounts to the same thing. Uh, you know, I might not even have the capacity to make a statue of myself, uh, leave alone making a grand, you know, or perhaps the grandest statue of them all, the statue of Ozymandias or uh, so on and so forth. I'm not going into political debates. There is a lot of political debate on the uh, idea of statues, whether statues are necessary, whether they cost a burden to the exchequer, uh, whether, you know, uh, that that is a, a proper utilization uh, of uh, uh, public funds and all that. But what I want to talk about more uh, specifically is the fact that uh, we all have a fascination, we all have a pull uh, with the idea of statues, you know. Uh, and I I'm sure that uh, when we talk about the aesthetic sense of, you know, statue making in the sense of sculpture, we would find that most uh, advanced civilizations um, did have uh, a, a very, you know, a good sense of sculpture. A, a lot of, you know, sculpted bodies um, remained at the end of the day. Uh, but sadly speaking, when I look at uh, the figure of the Sphinx, uh, I think in Giza, uh, uh, with that, you know, broken nose, um, uh, which of course is again the byproduct of time, I can't but, you know, uh, uh, help thinking that uh, isn't that the same destiny which was uh, meted out to Hirok Raj, uh, Raj's uh, statue, you know, Hirok Raj's statue, statue to Chilo, uh, in, in Bangla, I'm telling you this, because uh, if you remember that famous movie, Hirok Raj Deshi by Shotunit Ray, you would remember that, of course, that, that statue of uh, Hirok Raj um, uh, is, is, of course, the embodiment, the symbolic embodiment of monarchy. And ultimately, of course, uh, the next generation of youngsters and uh, the, the the soldiers, the farmers, and even the royalty, they all pull down the edifice of uh, monarchy so that I think a more uh, egalitarian rule is rendered possible. Uh, now, of course, uh, you know, in, in the sense of uh, an ethical understanding of the same, that is really a, a welcome suggestion. But uh, what is interesting is this, that I think uh, once you have, you know, established your sense of power, uh, and you no longer really have to, as a ruler, as an, as an emperor, you have to uh, think about uh, expanding your power, you have to basically just think about consolidating your power. Then uh, you have this uh, fear, I think, this, this latent fear, or you have this superiority complex that I should uh, enable this commanding of obedience from the body politic. 
and and that is where i think uh, the uh, the the idea of a statue uh, or or a sculpted you know uh, objective manifestation of the emperor becomes very very important and i think that is the reason why uh, this was commissioned um, and and of course the sculpture had uh, done a wonderful job but uh, we might not notice this uh, in the course of reading the poem that that actually creates a, a tripartite you know uh, narrative or voice structure because uh, you will see that uh, there is this uh, one uh, storyal idea that that actually comes from ozymandias himself the way he wanted to look uh, his his adamant you know visage being very manifest um and of course uh, the grand rhetoric that that had been uh, engraved uh, on the pedestal uh, his his pompous and bombast you know declarations uh, there is of course that thing with which he lived uh, his life um uh, and and then there is the other the, the second you know uh, pattern where the uh, the work of the sculptor becomes evident to us because because that is actually the only evidence on the basis of which we can evaluate ozymandias uh, because you see uh, whatever ozymandias had the pomp the glory the fear in the minds of the people they were all gone uh, what remained is the statue now of course uh, the statue would uh, be a work would be standing for an artifice you know it it would actually uh the uh symbolic of the uh the 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 uh, output of art uh, the way we have it uh, today uh, and of course the idea of you know the, the very romantic idea of transience versus permanence operating that way then then how would we you know evaluate um uh shelley's role or or the poet's role you know uh, the 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 poet persona's role uh, what is he doing i think he is also playing the role of uh, a, 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 a historian who is giving a, a retrospective uh, understanding of things so that a prospective understanding of things uh, is not manipulated you know we get a proper picture of what uh, history is you see uh, even today we have a very uh, improper way of reading history which is this that at one point of time they shun this so at this point of time we are going to shun this history is not about shunning things you know history is about acknowledging things you know acknowledging the truth without any uh, feeling of uh, bitterness you know uh, just to share a personal anecdote i had talked with um, a dear publisher about a prospective book of poems which i had named the empire of bitterness and he said that no no i don't like that title you know like let's not bring any bitterness into all this you know let's talk about love and happiness and cordiality so that is what i'm trying to tell you that you know uh, all that that bitterness uh, with which we try to filter the basic nuances of history uh, is something that we should not be uh, you know uh, practicing that way the, the the practice of history the historicizing uh, element should should not really be prejudiced uh, uh, from this point of view so i think that you know uh, uh, i'm not going into all that but if i make uh, this uh, very uh, modern uh, scientific understanding of uh, time uh, the kind of you know concepts that were laid laid down by mactagarts the uh, unreality of time or heidegger's being and time or or derrida's uh, critiques of husserl or uh, nietzsche's idea of uh, the eternal return of the same we would find that you know the uh, the the very specification of the way we uh, understand time and its uh, teleological narratives uh, do not necessarily entail that there has to be a unidimensional understanding or semiotics of uh, the perception of uh, the intersection of time and space so uh, yes there is this this basic idea that no matter how much we try 
there is uh, going to be uh, a sense of oblivion, uh, as Philip Larkin had mentioned in the poem uh, once, beyond all this, the desire of oblivion runs. But then this is also true that, as I mentioned, the idea of the trace, for instance, you know, there is always uh, a residue. Uh, and and uh, if art is that capture uh, from uh, the sieve of time, uh, even if that art is old pastoral, then uh, it has some bit of a credit. And, and that credit is not uh, dismantled with by uh, Shelley. Uh, now, let me come to some of the uh, you know, more literal aspects of the poem. The entire tenor of this poem centers around uh, the spatiotemporal praxis uh, on which it is predicated. But uh, perhaps that is what raises the poem to a, a level of, you know, a spiritual state of reckoning. We are actually talking about the material residue, but it is that material residue which actually enables or unlocks a, a spiritual anagnoritic understanding uh, from our hearts, you know, the way we receive that, st that statue. So, of course, there is a lot to do with the hermeneutical element involved, you know, uh, reception theory and all that, uh, that there might be uh, plural ways of, you know, receiving um, the, this, this uh, whole idea of what has been handed over to us uh, by history. So Ozymandias is actually uh, uh, the Greek name for the Egyptian pharaoh uh, Ramesses II, uh, the younger uh, Memon's statue was displayed in the British Museum. Uh, Shelley wrote the poem in 1817 after the British Museum's announcement um, that, uh, you know, I think there was this involvement of this Italian adventurer, Giovanni Battista Belzoni, who removed the bust uh, till the torso from the mortuary temple. Okay. And uh, by this time, I think, you know, Europe was already, you know, having a hots for uh, the exotic uh, appeal of other lands. Uh, I think if you look at it very carefully, and even Edward Said uh, does mention this in Orientalism, that much of the Napoleonic wars you know, uh, uh, led to uh, a sheer exoticization, uh, feminization, of the other, you know, lands like uh, Algeria, Egypt, uh, etc. They were kind of, you know, exoticized, feminized, and in the heart of, you know, England, uh, the uh, the the remote, the savage, the far off, uh, that had a, a sort of an appeal. Especially the Romantics were definitely uh, toying with that idea. But uh, this was a statue figurine that actually. I think uh, Napoleon was trying to uh, bring to France uh, after his uh, 1798 uh, expedition to um, Egypt. But then ultimately it came over to uh, Britain. And uh, Shelley, I think, was also influenced, other than this you know, uh, declaration of uh, uh, this museumological preserve which was being brought to uh, England. Other than this, Shelley was also influenced by the 1792 work uh, called The Ruins, which, was, uh, which had a subtitle or an alternate title called uh, Survey of the Revolutions of Empires. Uh, this was, uh, I think, uh, written by Constantin de Volney. Uh, and and uh, this, I think, had a profound uh, influence uh, when he was writing Queen Mab uh, in 1830. So one can understand why, you know, uh, Shelley was also trying to uh, bring in or, or perhaps rework uh, the idea of, uh, you know, a, a very dated uh, historical specimen uh, and, and try to see that, you know, in what way uh, was that making sense of the present times? You know, that is, that is one very important um, uh, element uh, of studying history, because the idea of, uh, you know, story is definitely there in history. Uh, but oftentimes we tend to censor things, we tend to filter things uh, based on the idea that some kind of historical uh, 
uh, uh, facts might actually uh, tend to be very volatile. They might uh, create communal discord or interracial, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 infighting, so on and so forth. Uh, but then, uh, ultimately, I think the truth is acknowledged, uh, should be acknowledged for the welfare of everyone. But uh, at the same time, there should be uh, an educative uh, or, or an educational process involved uh, in the whole thing, that this is uh, not to be interpreted in the sense of a corrective, but this is uh, to be interpreted in the sense of a lesson that, that, that we can uh, use uh, for our you know, future understanding uh, of uh, world affairs or our national affairs or even our personal affairs. Uh, I don't know whether this is important or not, but uh, I had heard that, you know, uh, Shelley had uh, used the anonymous pseudonym uh, Glirastes, uh, which uh, in Latin Gli uh, meant dormouse, uh, and Eraste for in Greek, which meant lover. So maybe he was actually talking about uh, his wife Mary Shelley, who had a nickname uh, by the same idea. So uh, a dormouse lover is uh, really an oddity in terms. But, uh, uh, you know, there is a specific reason. There is, there is a publication history behind the poem that I should talk about, uh, without which I think the students will not really appreciate the writing of this uh, poem, which is this that, uh, you know, when these poems uh, come down to us, uh, and, and by us I mean even, you know, uh, students and uh, we are all students of literary history, English literary history, and uh, in, in non-English, uh, you know, countries or uh, uh, English-speaking countries, uh, not in England, so to say. When, when that happens, you know, we often tend to view uh, all these works in a very, you know, canonical and reverential light. Uh, we should, we should do that. I'm not contesting that. But what I'm trying to say is this, that the germination of these poems, you know, the very generation of these poems, the conception of these poems often took place uh, under very interesting circumstances. Like, for instance, uh, Shelley had a literary circle, uh, and uh, it, it, it's quite like the study groups that we have today, uh, or, or maybe, you know, um, creative writing schools that we have today, uh, where I think, uh, or for that matter, you know, creative writing contests that we have today, where people are given uh, ideas, you know, let's say an opening line, and you write a story on that, uh, or or a concluding line, and you you write a skit on that. Uh, so there are these prompts, and we have to work on them. Uh, and uh, Shelley's literary circle consisted of very you know uh, nice people, nice in the sense that consisted of very talented people like his uh, wife Mary herself, uh, Horace Smith. Uh, John Keats, Lay Hunt, uh, so on and so forth. In this context, I should also uh, mention uh, in particular, and I'll come to that later, that Smith had a very uh, major role to play because uh, the idea of Ozymandias uh, as a theme uh, ultimately came down to Shelley and uh, Smith and, and how they you know, mutually worked out the whole thing in their individual ways is something I will speak about shortly. Uh, but uh, they had, you know, uh, chosen a specific passage from Diodorus Siculus's Bibliotheca Historica, this wonderful uh, text manual. And from where there is this, this idea of, you know, comes and uh, tells us about The resonating Amitav Ghosh's very wonderful novel, which also talks about uh, a visit to a land uh, in the Egyptian context, you know, uh, definitely had a lot of historical stories to talk about. Uh, but what I uh, must uh, point out in this case is this that even the traveler, uh, once again, a, a sort of a non entity, you know, there are so many in innumerable uh, Western travelers. And travel is uh, a very important uh, 
part of Western education. We all know that because uh, travel is, uh, you know, a, a sort of a, a self-discovery. Travel is a learning process. So, uh, till the and I quote from the text: "Let him outdo me in my work. Let him outdo me in my work." So there is this vanity that I have made the most of my time, and you couldn't make it. You know, uh, I have achieved more uh, than anybody else could, uh, and and this vanity is. Very deadening, you know. It is it is very destructive because it actually uh, tends to make you myopic, uh, which is one of the reasons why we constantly uh, critique any form of administration that forgets to you know consider the welfare of the people as its topmost priority. And uh, based on that, I think that you know uh, the sense of uh, deprivation. That the common people might have suffered uh, in his own time, you know, uh, is something that we do not talk about. You know, we we tend to talk about in when we when we tend to talk about history, we tend to talk about in terms of camps. You know, so I am either pro Mughal history or I am anti Mughal history. That is a ridiculous idea. You know, uh, if I say that Akbar's reign. Uh, was uh, very prosperous uh, for the common body politic, but uh, for that matter, Shah Jahan's reign was not. Then I'm not really taking a, a, a favorite angle uh, into anything because uh, one, one might think about this that uh, expensive monuments uh, did cost heavy on the exchequer. So one might as well think about the condition of the people of uh, during that time. So so is it really uh, very uh, good. Is, is it really very workable? That is something we need to uh, think about. You know, when when we talk about any kind of uh, a democratic dissemination of uh, wealth uh, and attention, uh, and we must understand one thing that uh, Shelley had some uh, priorities that he uh, stuck to uh, all his life. Uh, Shelley was. Uh, uh, very much, you know, let me mention in this context, he was a, a true uh, Republican in that sense. He, he really wanted uh, a more holistic, you know, uh, spread of uh, political participation. Uh, the, 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 the democratic, you know, uh, fount of uh, political wisdom is also definitely uh, present in most of his work works. And uh, of course, he was a big advocate of the freedom of speech, uh, peaceful assembly. I think uh, the right to peaceful assembly was violated uh, during the Peterloo massacre, uh, and, and that is what he criticizes in one particular poem. Uh, he was a, definitely an all-round, you know, welfare reformist. That is how I would, uh, you know, uh, understand him because. Uh, he he advocated Catholic emancipation, parliamentary reform. Uh, he also wanted the extension of franchising to almost you know um, everyone possible. Uh, and and uh, of course, I'm not going into his ideas of free love, but even that is uh, a proof that he was against this you know very parochial, uh, institutionalized uh, you know privileging of priorities. You know. That, that the sense of privileges and entitlements should go to only a handful number of people is something that he uh, vehemently challenged uh, in his own way. Uh, and and uh, of course, the influence of you know, Rousseau, uh, the influence of uh, Thomas Paine, Godwin, Wollstonecraft, uh, Leigh Hunt, uh, the uh, Owenist and Chartist ideas that are there in his works, which ultimately, you know, uh, consolidated in the 1820 work called the philosophical view of reform, have to be taken into account if we understand the the spirit behind uh, this point. But uh, we must understand that uh, Ozai Mandius had cast a very, very, you know, uh, significant appeal uh, to contemporary popular culture. I'm not going into the uh, you know examples right now because that would be a deviation. Uh, but what I would like to point out in this context is this that 
uh, a poem like this acts as a sort of a warning, uh, as, as a sort of a filter to some of the excesses that were uh, committed uh, by the empire. You know? uh, for instance, one might talk about uh, the work called the poem called 1811, which actually came out in 1812. Uh, this was written by Anna uh, Leishia Barbeau. And Barbeau, I think, was uh, uh, a very good poet. It's a very brief poem. But um, she was heavily censured for writing this poem. She was ridiculed so much so that she even gave up writing poetry. Uh, she actually talks about a war uh, ruined London where uh, you know, contemporary tourists come to visit. Uh, and, and this is not something that was very uh, welcome during her own time because uh, the success uh, of Britain in the Napoleonic Wars had meant that, you know, how could you talk about uh, the empire in terms of uh, a plight? You know, how could you talk about the empire in terms of uh, helplessness? That is not done. But as we know that sometimes, you know, artists uh, talk about prophecies, you know, they, they, they prophesy things. Um, and uh, Barbeau had actually kind of, you know, very ominously prophesied that uh, uh, England, or, or for that matter, Greek Britain at that point of time, uh, wouldn't really uh, have the same predicament lasting forever. And uh, although it won uh, temporary victories and it, it got a massive footing after the Napoleonic Wars, we know what happened to Britain after the Second World War. Uh, and and Barbo actually talks about the rise of America in her uh, you know uh, poems uh, in in her poem this particular poem and and that was also ridiculed at that point of time but ultimately we had seen that uh, from the base of the British Empire and from the ruins of the German Empire the American Empire was uh, eventually formed so uh, there is this interesting line in that poem which I would like to um, quote in the context of Ozymandias as well. Uh, and the line that Barbol mentions is, thou who hast shared the guilt, thou who hast shared the guilt, must share the woe. Must share the woe means sorrow or suffering. And the last line, or I think the last line in that sequence, 39 to 49, I think, is ruin as with an earthquake shock is here. So think about that, you know, like think about the monarch himself in retrospect, in that, you know, stony lifelessness, there is a sort of life that is emanating, you know, through that, that very idea of uh, the cold pastoral, the Keatsian cold pastoral, eternalizing the moment forever. Uh, through that, I think Ozymandias post-death had seen what time does you know it it had seen that perhaps there is no emperor who is more powerful uh, than time perhaps you know time is god at the end of the day as i mentioned uh, at the start of my lecture time is all that we have you know time is the like love is the cause of all our uh, happiness as well as the cause of you know all our uh, sorrows which is again an, an idea that uh, uh, his dear friend Byron had pointed out uh, at one point of time. So when we are talking about Ozymandias, I'm, I'm sure that we are also talking about uh, the sense of apocalypse that uh, time eventually brings. Um, and if you feel that this is apocalyptic poetry that we are talking about, uh, you wouldn't be entirely wrong uh, because, you know, the fragments of this funereal uh, statue uh, does does talk about a lot of things, you know. Uh, there, there is, of course, uh, this uh, preserve that has been uh, attributed to it. Um, I think even the Shelley Godwin Digital Archives uh, also has preserved all, you know, uh, the manuscripts uh, of uh, Shelley. Uh, and and I think that uh, this particular handwritten manuscript is there in the Bodleian Library. So yes, there is that sense of preserve that renown brings. And, and from that uh, accord, I think that even the bust uh, had been preserved somewhere or the other. But the basic idea is, in what way? 
you know, in the sense of being eaten away. You know, if you if you recall that famous uh, metaphysical poem to his coy mistress, uh, and and you would understand. But at my back, uh, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. So yes, there is always that idea of time catching up and time uh, corroding everything. You know, ev everything. Uh, is ultimately being taken away by time. So what is it that we can do uh, that can actually make our lives uh, truly uh, profitable? Because this is a sort of a needs that we have. Uh, what we can actually do is uh, we can do away with corruption. We can make lives better for ourselves and others. Uh, we can give a legacy to others which they will uh, pass on as the legacy for their future generations. Uh, it, it's, it's ultimately a sort of a heirloom. And heirlooms are not to be, you know, uh, uh, or legacies are not to be bartered with or sold. They're just to be handed over to subsequent generations. Uh, so, so it's in the form of a trust. And if I say that Ozymandias had handed over his bust to futurity or, or posterity, then th that's a very sad state of affairs because uh, you know, when, when we talk about uh, an emperor like uh, Dharmashoka, not the Chondashoka idea, but the Dharmashoka idea, when we talk about Ashoka the Great, we, we, today we know him to be great, not because of the horrendous battles that he fought like that at Kalinga, but for the good deeds that he had done, uh, for the uh, emancipatory welfare activities that he had partaken in. So uh, ultimately, it does become a political project. Uh, ultimately, your actions, your uh, work speaks for yourself. Um, and and uh, there are people who will applaud your work. There are people who will criticize your work. But you have to do the right work in the right way. And, and I think uh, that sense of you know, uh, righteousness uh, is, is something that motivated uh, Shelley to you know, conceive a poem like this. If I might very briefly mention the poem that uh, Horace Smith had written uh, in this competition along with uh, Shelley, uh, and, and I briefly quote from that poem, which is also entitled Ozymandias, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I think Shelley's masterpiece eclipsed uh, his poem. Uh, but um, I, I want to take that poem also as a parallel read, and I quote a couple of lines uh, which might interest you. One particular line is, uh, or sense of lines are like these. In Egypt's sandy silence, all alone, stands a gigantic leg, which far off throws the only shadow that the desert knows. You know, we have done rhetorical figures. We know part for the whole and all that. Uh, so, so ultimately, Ozymandias is reduced to just a stony leg, you know, uh, which is which again is ironical because I think in in the actual bust the hands and legs are uh, sort of you know broken and all that. The part of the head is broken and all that. So it it really didn't come in the exact extant form in which it was uh, handed over to us. And uh, another line of uh, the uh, another couple of lines of the that particular poem uh, is. The city is gone, not but the leg remaining to disclose the site of this forgotten Babylon. So ultimately, it's a, 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 a kind of, you know, this uh, Babylonian uh, remnant uh, that is handed over to us. And, and we uh, don't know how to kind of, you know, reciprocate to it uh, in the sense of fullness, of course. Uh, we can still have a sense of that awe that maybe this was at one point of time really uh, grand and all that. But the historical reading by the poet persona actually undercuts the artistic creation of the sculptor. You see, that is very important. Nobody remembers the sculptor. Uh, everybody remains, remembers the name of the king you know, whose work uh, he had sculpted. Uh, and and uh, of course, uh, Shelley is, is writing uh, the, the commentary. The poem is actually a kind of a commentary uh, on the sculpture in the form of uh, a historical reassessment 
so the reassessment should not be in the sense of the positive you know the reassessment is actually a deflation of the pomposity that the sculptor had been commissioned to portray the sculptor had done his work irrespective of the fact whether the sculptor had a personal respect for osimandias or not maybe he hated the king from the bottom of his heart but he had done his job well you know he had done his work well and and uh, uh, you know uh, shelley had come and punctured the whole process but of course not with a subjective assessment only with objective veracity of the scene because time had indeed uh, you know subject this entire uh, thing to a state of decrepitude and and that is unmistakable so uh, this is something that i think uh, uh, we must uh, remember a couple of other points before i uh, end my lecture which is this that uh, i think uh, personally speaking i i i'm not wrong if i Uh, uh you know remind myself that uh, a biographical study of shelley's life would throw some uh, you know bits and pieces of uh, understanding about how you know the tenor of this poem shapes up which is this that uh, shelley was i think uh, uh, kind of you know ragged uh, during his school days ragging is not the uh, appropriate term i think fagging is the appropriate uh, term which is this that in in these uh, elite public schools and all that in britain uh, the fag master which is the senior would uh, kind of you know uh, delegate uh, menial responsibilities to the juniors uh, and and this institutional memory had a sort of a traumatic uh, you know filter in in shelley's mind that uh, he kind of uh, uh, never liked these uh, sort of hegemonic uh, you know overbearing attitudes uh, coming on anyone uh, he really never had uh, a very you know uh, uh, affectionate uh, take on the idea of uh, structured hierarchies you know i'm not saying that he wanted to dismantle uh, hierarchy social and political hierarchies completely but he he, he did not want it to be uh systems of hegemony that is something that i think uh, we must keep in mind and and that is why i think a figure like uh, ozymandias a personality like ozymandias would actually be a a sort of an intimidating personality uh, that he would want to kind of you know challenge and uh, ozymandias though it is named after uh, the king is actually a uh, a counter text you know it it actually talks against the king it's quite the same as i think samuel taylor coleridge does uh, in kubla khan that when we start reading the poem we feel that it is about uh, the great oriental monarch uh, kublai khan but eventually we are reminded that no maybe it is it is not just about uh, the literal pleasure dome but it it is about the recreative romantic dome that we are actually talking about it is the Uh, the demise of classicism and the birth of romanticism that we are actually talking about so um i think that uh, there are many other works by shelley that actually uh, go to kind of you know uh, talk about this this transition that shelley had had from a mechanistic uh, determinism to what i would call a, a transcendentalist uh, idealism uh, this term is these terms are not mine definitely they are not mine these are actually mentioned by the very famous uh, you know uh, uh, english uh, literary uh, critic uh, david deshies he he admits to this transition that shelley had uh, undergone in in the course of uh, his uh, you know uh, writing career poetic career but at the same time uh, let me conclude by saying that uh, so much of you know uh, public uh, perceptions so much of um, an egalitarian collective thinking on the part of shelley and yet uh, we would hesitate before uh, you know attributing to him the status of uh, let's say a poet laureate um, like wordsworth or, or even the irish poet laureate like shemus heaney 
because I think that uh, Shelley was very abstracted in his uh, mythopoeic imagination and uh, eccentric unworldliness. And I think that uh, in a very strange way, uh, melodramatism and uh, you know meaning uh, coexisted together in his in his uh, writings. Uh, he did not live to see the reform bills and all that. The sense uh, of transition that England would take during the Victorian era, but uh, it it does talk about the fact that you know every uh, external revolution must uh, always be preceded by an inner or internal uh, preparedness you know uh, we need an individual preparation to participate in a collective venture together uh, so of course uh, unless there is that 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 preparation which is meted out um, any kind of you know change uh, change is inevitable change would automatically uh, take place but any kind of benevolent change uh, on a societal praxis, uh, perhaps uh, will not take place. So uh, this is Shelley's deduction from his understanding of philosophy uh, from Socrates right down to Godwin uh, himself. That that whichever be the era, this uh, you know inner honesty of the self with itself uh, has to be always uh, taken into accord. And uh, to put it that way, then perhaps the the kings and the monarchs were too blinded by their megalomania. Uh, they uh, believed that their sway of rule would be permanent. But then, as we all know, uh, change is perhaps the only permanent thing in this world. And likewise, they were also subject to decay, their mortal frames as well as their statues. So with that, uh, I conclude. Uh, I think I have stuck to time as the time frame that Shujato had given me. And if there are any observations, I'll uh, take it now. Yeah. Thank you. Over to you. Yeah, Shujato. thank you, Shubhati. Can I be can I be heard? Yeah, can you, I be heard? Yeah, you are uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Shubhati, uh, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, uh, listening to you, I was thinking that uh, uh, Shubhati, uh, today I think you have broken a narrative. And that is very important. That is why I, I wanted uh, you to be here amongst us, because you always break narratives. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I really do think that uh, I was thinking about uh, a very famous critic of us, you know very well, Graham Howe, uh, who uh, said that, that uh, in, his, in his very famous book, Romantic Poets, that came out in 1964, you're very well aware of, uh, well aware of it. It came out in, uh, from New York. Uh, he said that Ozymandias is an extremely clear and direct poem uh, advancing to a predetermined end by means of one firmly held image. You did break that narrative, number one. Number two, uh, reiterating and repeating uh, the, the great drama out, uh, Desmond Kinghel, if you remember, again in his famous work, Shelley, his thought and work that came out in London, Macmillan, the same year in 1964. So that was happening, all that was happening in 1964. He, he opined that in Ozymandias, Shelley is content with a, a limited objective, a straightforward piece of irony, and he succeeds completely. You again broke that narrative. So it was lovely listening to you, Shubhodi. Uh, uh, as I'd always said that uh, I, I really, really feel proud of being the convener of this uh, organizing committee to have invited you here. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, we have a number of questions out there. Uh, some of yeah. them had flashed uh, on the screen, and uh, some are there. Uh, there are a lot in my WhatsApp and all these things. I just like to point one or two. Uh, one is that that uh, uh, one of our students has pointed out that is there any particular reason uh, uh, why the political sonnet was a priority form for Shelley? Uh, to give yeah. uh, your opinion. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Shujato, for that. Uh, yes, uh, I think that you know, like uh, as I mentioned just just before the close of my lecture, that uh, Shelley was aware of you know uh, the ills that were uh, there in England at that point of time, and and most of the uh, social ills uh, or or you know political uh, 
you know, uh, I think uh, uh, let's call it that way that political turmoils that he had uh, lived through uh, had influenced him a lot. You know, I, I, I don't think that uh, as, as many critics uh, do opine, many neg negative, you know, minded critics do opine that uh, Shelley is all about abstractions and abstract ideas. And he is, he is entirely a, a kind of, you know, a winged uh, idealist. These are all, you know, very uh, uh, inappropriate, uh, I think, uh, readings of Shelley. Because uh, let's keep one thing in mind that due to his uh, radical ideas, uh, Shelley often had fears of libel, sedition, you know, he, he was very aware of sedition laws, um, and, and I'm sure that you have heard about the recent, uh, you know, uh, judicial verdict where, which talks about whether the British sedition laws or the sedition laws that were made during the British regime, largely to curb, uh, uh, you know, indigenous uh, uprisings, is, is it really still important in a post-independent India? So sedition laws are often, uh, you know, malappropriated or misappropriated. And um, uh, Shelley was also kept under, uh, you know, uh, political surveillance majorly by the, I think, uh, uh, Home uh, Ministry, if I'm not mistaken. So, so there was a, a watch eye uh, of the, by the Home Office on him. He could not really say everything directly the way he had wanted to. But yes, let me also point out, uh, say, having said that, that uh, the political sonnet had existed uh, through and through, you know, since the post-Elizabethan era, even during the Elizabethan era, even in the Victorian era, we will find that with Matthew Arnold, we will find that with some of Browning's uh, writings, that uh, I uh, uh, would not agree that, you know, the, the sonnet is really always about love. It had to do a lot uh, to do with uh, different, you know, uh, critical vantage points of power and politics. Uh, and, and that is what uh, I think uh, became important in the case of Shelley, sometimes overtly and sometimes covertly. Shujat. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Shubhavi. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, now, the thing that uh, uh, I was thinking that you were talking about this uh, 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 Shelley's friend and uh, Horace Smith, and uh, uh, basically you know very very well that both their Ozymandias came out almost on the same same day. Same. And uh, uh, I was thinking uh, while listening to you, I, I was thinking that uh, uh, when you when you come down to Shelley's Ozymandias, uh, and that uh, uh, it's uh, wonderful written that well my name is Ozymandias and king of kings so uh, and then uh, look at my words yea uh, mighty and despair do you really sense a kind of rivalry between the two I mean <laughs> since you were mentioning how to speak <laughs> yeah 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 no you see uh, Shujato this uh, thing is uh, to be interpreted in a very uh, kind of intimate manner it's, it's the kind of uh, I think uh, a rivalry that uh, starts off between close friends and maybe ends uh, with a couple of opium joints between them. That's the kind of you know rivalry that we talk about. Uh, but yes, one thing which is very much uh, interesting is this: that this was a very healthy uh, you know indulgence because this actually helped them bring out the best of their works. Because you see, uh, it, it actually uh, taught them, it actually propelled them to kind of uh, see the same topic from different vantage points. And uh, yes, you are very much right when you talk about the literary critics, because uh, if I am not mistaken, when I was talking about a philosophical view of reform, uh, which was, I think, written around 1820, uh, the actual understanding, recognition, and uh, public dissemination of that work came around uh, 1920. Uh, it was published around 1920. So that's over almost like a hundred years since its inception. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, th things take time. Not everybody is properly understood in his own or in his or her own milieu. And uh, that was the same with Shelley. He was a man uh, perhaps well advanced uh, with his, uh, in his time. 
and that that's something that his friends knew the most uh, most of his friends acknowledged the fact that he had a very liberal heart uh, and uh, which which is also uh, to do with his personal world view and uh, he always dwelt on this strange interstice between nihilism and narcissism you know you would know about nihilism better than me but uh, it's not to say that i would know narcissism better than you about that but what i'm trying to tell about is the fact that you know don't you think that we all uh, live on these precipices of interstices we we really don't live on uh, proper camps that way we are always on the flux of uh, time literally so so that was there with shelly and uh, uh, he also lived a very shifty life if you recollect the fact that he had to change multiple uh, houses uh, there were times when he was short of money he was he had uh, you know income generation problems there were times when he was having a good time with some of his elite friends like byron um, uh, there were several disagreements uh, in the course of his domestic life his his marital uh, you know uh, crisis uh, that took place over time uh, and of course this this very radical uh, personal philosophy that he uh, you know championed um, which uh, i think uh, might have led uh, many a, a contemporary to conclude that he was almost a pseudo lunatic at that point of time but uh, if we try to connect the dots we would find that uh, actually they connect very well uh, he was he was really talking sense yeah yes yes definitely definitely sure uh, i have uh, one very uh, uh, student like question uh, uh, how would you account for the tremendous popularity of ozymandias in english literary history i think yeah, that, that's that, that, that how, how maybe replaced by why also <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 no actually you know like uh, uh, firstly i would like to say that it is very difficult to predict uh, why something becomes popular or or what is that element that makes something popular you know uh, of course as we all know that everything uh, which is a classic may not be popular everything which is popular may not be classic there are these theories that we all know about but uh, i think that uh, the reason why ozyme angels became very popular is the fact that it encompasses a lot of views together you know uh, on one hand it it picks up this uh, historical idea very well which is the backdrop of the poem and then it also kind of you know tends to uh, interconnect that idea with some of the key elements of romanticism there were some key expectations from romantic poets like they would be talking about uh, truth they would be talking about justice uh, they would they would be talking about uh, a revolutionary quest uh, they would be talking about uh, a pragmatic understanding of uh, idealism and and those were things that uh, i think uh, fell in line with the poem other than the fact that as i mentioned at the very start that it's a very wonderfully structured poem its brevity is its uh, is its reward uh, it's not too longish uh, there are there are works uh, where uh, shelly did not achieve what he was trying to do uh, maybe because he became a bit too bombastic or it became a bit too melodramatic um, i think we might take up the example of that uh, the cosmic drama uh, the sensi uh, as an example you know those are works which are lesser known because they had uh, these uh, technical problems but but this was a work which was very very structured and that is i think one of the reason why uh, you know some of the yes. earlier critics believe that this was very fragmentary this this was very uh, slipshod uh, that's the kind of observation we have had for kubla khan as well with coleridge because that was a fragmentary opium dream and the entire idea was not had but if we look at the structure of the poem if we look at the the uh, the interlacing between theme and structure we would understand that it's a perfect poem in its own right doesn't matter if he even if he forgot you know uh, 75% of the dream the the wording the structuring the the praxis of the poem stands pretty well and uh, that is uh, one more thing which i think that credits this particular poem is that there is this element of simplicity you know the theme is not very complex 
even if you do not understand the deeper connections it would still have a sort of an appeal on you and you know this this sense of uh, a sort of nostalgia would be there on you you know this the the kind of nostalgia that actually comes to us when we visit any kind of ruin you know any kind of uh, ruin edifice if you visit if you visit a palatial uh, structure if you visit a temple if you visit a fort it, it's that kind of belatedness that would come to you that is i think what uh, uh, has also appealed to the poem at large uh, and ultimately of course the very stature of shelley had a lot to do with it uh his his controversial figure uh, had to do a lot with it uh but overall i'm happy that it became so uh, uh you know uh, popular and and it was received so well down the line yeah thank you thank you thank you shubhadeep uh another thing was that uh, the i was thinking and you know talking about dealers and that uh, we always keep on telling uh, students about the uh, the imagination Of 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 Shelley, really, we uh, love to read his poems. Not only for 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 the lyrics, for the sake of lyrics, but but for the sake of of brilliant imagination that uh, Shelley gives us. When Diodorus, uh, when Shelley was picking these things from Diodorus, if you, if you remember, uh, and you know very very well that in Diodorus the the figure was actually sitting and not standing, and yeah, yeah. Uh, once again he. in the rest the thing was taking place uh, was taking place in front of the temple and not in not in the desert so the, 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 i was just thinking of the imagination this is what we keep on telling to the students i'd love uh, you to comment on the brilliant imagination of pb shelley so that uh, the, they can uh, they can understand uh, about the imagination of of uh, shelley simply so uh, just yeah, a comment yeah, on yeah. that shubhadeep that would be great yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was a very uh, wonderful uh, point out that you had made because it, it's indeed true that we must not forget the the literal uh, event that actually transpired before the poem was written which is this that uh, that was taken from a temple edifice you know and and you are very much right that that was actually uh, kind of uh, what's the right word for that you know looted wouldn't be a right word but that was uh, kind of you know transfixed uh, in the in the british uh, uh, museological yes. context yeah uh, so uh, but the thing is this that um, this this very sense that if it is housed in a temple in a very proper manner that would perhaps uh, give a sense of you know oriental uh, sacrality and sanctitude which i think shelley did not want to bring you know uh, and that that would make a better sense or a bigger sense to have something exposed in the windy desert you know as if like uh, just as temples which are built close to the sea they are constantly lashed by the waves it's as if the desert the corrosive desert air is constantly eroding uh, the the uh, statue and uh, even if we uh, do not take that into account the idea is this that that cannot become a permanent figure it will ultimately be uh, subject to decadence but uh, what is important is the preserve that has been made and you would notice one thing that uh, when i talked about the cold pastoral what is preserved is very important you know if we are talking about a romantic freeze then uh, if the freeze is of two lovers who are trying to kind of you know uh, join their hands together uh, that would have one appeal but if it is about an emperor who is trying to inflict a uh, corporal punishment on a subject that would have another appeal so i think that uh, that is something which uh, uh, shelly also brings to mind that what is it that we will be remembered for uh that is also something that uh, we need to think about and uh, maybe shape our lives accordingly uh, in that sense i think uh, shelley has this wonderful hermeneutical trick by which he even surpasses the sculptor uh, his sense of you know historical reading is uh, actually an addendum on uh, the sculptor's you know uh, artistic or aesthetic work so yes you are very much right in 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 pointing that out yeah thank you shubhadeep uh, thank you for being with us uh, uh, for a long time in fact uh, i feel that uh, the, i should have given you uh, 
much more time because I <laughs> simply remain glued <laughs> listening to you as I generally do by listening to you. And uh, I'm sure that our students and students uh, other than Build the College who have joined here and uh, watching uh, this thing, uh, the Shubhadeep, uh, Dr. Shubhadeep Paul's lecture uh, live on YouTube, streaming live on YouTube, uh, all must have benefited immensely from uh, this lecture. Uh, thank you, Shubhadeep, once more. Thank you for being with us and thank you for giving us time. And uh, in our future uh, uh, webinars, conferences, web conferences, I, I, I really, it's really unfortunate to say these things because. We are generally used to seminars and conferences rather than webinars and web conferences. Uh, but still, yes, uh, uh, if we if we organize some uh, something in the future, I'll, I'll I'm requesting you in advance to be be with us, please, sure. uh, so that we can we can hear more from you. I now hand over sure. hand it over to thank you thank you Shubhadeep. Uh, I now hand it over to uh, Mr. Minal Kantidash, Faculty uh, Department of English, Belda College. He's also the co-convener of this uh, of this organizing committee of this six day online uh, lecture series on english literature 2021 organized by the department of english build up the college i hand it over to you minal to give the vote of thanks thank you very much thank you thank you dr sujata rose actually a uh, departmental teacher uh, good afternoon everyone uh, myself um, it is an immense pleasure to take this opportunity to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of the Department of English, Bella College. First of all, I like to thank our today's guest and eminent speaker, Dr. Subhadi Paul, Assistant Professor, Department of English, School of Literature, Language and Culture and Studies, Bakuna University, for a thoughtful and spontaneous discussion and enlightening us with your deep sense of knowledge. Though uh, such kind of vote, vote of thanks is a very formal part of any program, but honestly, sir, I can say that I think others uh, would be agree with me that it was a privilege to me, especially I can say that. It's a, a thank, great privilege to me to be an attentive listener of this topic for one and a half, uh, half, and, uh, uh, half hour. To me, it was really a fantastic journey, I think. Uh, of Sally's visionary world, a world of imagination, a world of romanticism. And according to Pitts, I can say that was it a vision or a waking thing? Really, sir, your lecture was full of uh, philosophy, in five or provocations. He gave to all the participants, participants participating on Google Meet uh, or online streaming viewers, uh, a deep sense into the Topic with your interesting facts that covered up. That the poem and the area uh, you focused us about the poem Ojaimandias was really, really informative. Your lecture shows the univocal consistency in the poetic portrayal of uh, Ojaimandias through different images, through different uh, what I say. Uh, images, symbols, and thematic uh, thematic content. This poetic appraisal and the rhetoric you have used, uh, you discussed in the poem, uh, uh, reinforce the central idea of transience and survival of creativity. What I think is the essence of the poem. We come to know from your lecture uh, that nothing remains static, uh, nor can avoid gaps of the fatal death. I think it it is a piece of creativity that transcends the level of tyranny. In your scholastic lecture, uh, you mentioned Shelley as a rebel poet. Shelley spoke against the, uh, uh, against, the against the unconventionalized society and its manners. The portrayal of a broken image uh, of a tyranny of tyrant becomes aesthetically realistic by hands of Shelley. Uh, by your flawless discussion, you also mentioned the Shelley style. I think in style, Shelley forgoes the conventional rhyme scheme, which underscores the poem's essential irony. You have all you have also rightly pointed out Shelley's way of depicting the statue of Ojemendius, which becomes more artistic, I think, than history. History. 
I think um, actually you might have mentioned I I didn't mention uh, the critic Leslie Bisman's remark uh, uh, signifies that comment that a uh, thematic concern in your vivid uh, discussion you mentioned the period of England the period Shelley lived in was an extremely chaotic and you know Shelley yes. was not happy with this situation. The British government of, uh, was afraid of any kind of revolution. Though several political events uh, uh, inspire and shape Shelley's writing, but he never to make, to make any explicit explicit remark about politics and argue about that. Another issue you have covered up in the description of the in the desert. Uh, it is a very vivid and uh, by Sally uh, in Ojai Mendes to put light on the momentary transcendence of power. All the scatter and fragmented images of the statue, statue establish Sally's romantic legacy of transience. And, uh, and uh, you have mentioned the biographical uh, sketch, uh, whatever you, uh, you mentioned that the controversial and also the statistical information you have given the megalomania. It's a very uncommon term to us actually. I am pretty sure that the, uh, the philosophical knowledge that you shared with us this evening or this apparently helped in our studies and space students of second uh, semester of Vidyasagar University as well. Once again, uh, I would like to thank you, sir, uh, for taking addressing the web series with your thorough and deep knowledge with extremely relevant socialist and of course, and so I thought uh, our beloved to organizing these six days uh, lecture series. Also, I want to thank Dr. Asif Ponda and organizing secretary of these six days lecture series, IQSC coordinator, and above all, HOD of our English department. My deep thanks of appreciation and thanks to all my beloved colleagues of English department who really worked hard within uh, uh, and made this event very successful within short span, in spite of their recent common killed by uh, pandemic virus. Also, I like to thank Mr. Subir Sir, who is not only the techni technical expert or logistic support of this lecture series. But beloved colleagues of our this his table unseen support not only to our English department but to all the departments of Hilda College. Last but not the least, very, very big thanks to my all my beloved students who are present here for paying your attention and learning. I would uh, I would uh, end my speech here. Thank you once again, Dr. Uh, Subodipal, uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, have a wonderful day ahead and best wishes for tomorrow's lecture. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you.